Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. We're going to do part two of our study that's called Be at Peace, God Has Your Back. Remember, we covered so many scriptures in our last study that should just give you perfect peace of mind. Whether you got ripped off by somebody or whether people are coming at you for whatever reason, you know God's with you. And we're going to cover some more great verses today. Remember in Luke chapter 18, the unjust judge, that the wicked guy who didn't care about God or anybody else, but the woman kept asking him, and so he finally said, all right, I'll avenge you. But then it goes on to say, how much more will God avenge his elect who cry to him day and night? So don't worry, God is going to avenge you. God is going to set things right. And there's a couple verses I want to mention before we start. First of all, Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Remember, Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. But Joseph brings out so much wisdom in that verse. And he says, my brothers, they had a wicked mindset to do it. But he says that God ended up using it all to end up saving many people from that famine. So his brothers thought it for evil, but God used it for good. So some situations might come up. You might think, well, why is this happening? But remember, God will use it even as a productive thing many times. And remember Romans chapter 8, verse 28, all things work for good to those who are called according to God's purpose. So just remember, keep your faith in God and everything will be just fine. And I want you to remember also Proverbs chapter 15, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 18, where it says that a man who, who is quick to anger, he's going to cause strife. I mean, if you let every single little thing just make you mad, then problems are going to happen. But then it says, if you are slow to anger, that appeaseth strife, meaning it's going to cause strife to not even happen. So just remember, stay calm. Remember, God is on the throne. And I want to mention Exodus chapter, uh, chapter 23 and Exodus chapter 14, where it says that if you obey the voice of God, God will be an enemy to your enemies. So once again, you have nothing to worry about. God is always going to be with you. I want to also remind you of, we read a few verses in Psalm chapter 37 in our last study, where it's saying, don't be jealous if it seems like wicked people are doing good. I mean, people, you might remember, or you might think about a lot of people, they might be jealous like of drug dealers. Look how, how much they have. They're doing it by getting in the way of wicked ways. People might be jealous of that. Well, if you ever start to feel that way, read Psalms 37. It says they're going to be cut off. They're going to be cut off, cut down like the grass. So it might seem like people, wicked people are doing good for a second. Don't worry. It is not going to last. You remember to stay on the right path and you will be very blessed. And we, I also, I think we mentioned it in the last study. I want to mention it again. James chapter 5, verse 4, where it says, God hears the cries of those who are getting ripped off. And that verse, it's specifically talking about if you got ripped off by your employer. Don't worry, God's going to set things right. And then you go down to verse 10 and 11 of James chapter 5. It's, it's, it says there, how uh, t remember what the prophets went through and be joyful in affliction and remember the patience of Job. And I mean, what Job went through in the first two chapters of Job, we're never going to have to go through anything like that. But Job still, he never cursed God and he, he just stayed faithful. So remember all those things. There are so many examples that will get us through the hard times. So just be at peace. Know God has your back. We're going to get into some more scriptures. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word and for this place you've given us. We can teach your word and for all the peace that you give us. And we just ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear, to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you, and we love you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, the first place we're going to start is Romans chapter 12. We're going to pick it up in Romans chapter 12, verse 12. 
give you a second to turn there. So Romans chapter 12, verse 12, and it reads, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. That means you be constantly diligent in prayer. Hard times start coming up, pray to God. And to pray to God is just to talk to Him. Let Him know what you're going through and remember, stay in His Word. But have be constantly diligent in prayer. God always give you that comfort and the Holy Spirit is even called the comforter. Remember the, the parakletos we had a study a while back called the intercessor that was all about that. And of course, take this to the very end, the tribulation of the false Christ. You know that you're going to be just fine. You know you're protected. Be patient. Verse 13. Distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Help out others when you have the opportunity. It's interesting that given to hospitality, that Greek word is only used in one other place. It's Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. And it says, uh, be, use, uh, be hospitable, have good hospitality, because some people have even entertained angels without even realizing it. Verse, thir or verse 14. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. That means don't go talking bad about people, even if they did bad to you. Don't go talking bad about them. And remember in our last study, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 14. Rejoice in the good days, but when afflictions come up, consider. God hath even set one over against the other. Remember, we don't always realize it at the time. But And of course, I want to make it clear, like in Jeremiah 23, don't go blaming your problems on God. Accidents just happen sometimes. Luke chapter 13 makes that clear as well. But sometimes things might happen, like Joseph being sold into slavery. Might seem like something real bad's happening at the time. But once again, God used that to save thousands and thousands of people. So remember, God's on the throne. Be patient. Verse 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Always have sympathy. Our Savior Jesus Christ has sure has a lot of sympathy. And He even, when he, God came in the flesh as the Son, Jesus Christ, He suffered so much. So He knows exactly how to get us through the hard times, because He went through hard times. Um, and that's basically what it says at the end of Hebrews chapter 2 and the end of Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 16. Be of the same mind one toward another. Once again, be, be sympathetic. We're all a part of the same body. It says in Corinthians, when, when one suffers, we all suffer. But also, when one rejoices, when something happens to good, when something good happens to one, we all rejoice. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Now, obviously, that word condescend, it doesn't mean like how we think of condescending, which would be a bad thing. But what this is saying is don't seek to exalt yourself. Don't have your mind set on high things like you're trying to exalt yourself to some great position. We don't exalt ourselves. We remain humble and let God do the exalting. But so what this is saying is um, men to low estate, go on, on other people's level. And like it would teach in other places to, to, the, to the Israelites, I came as an Israelite. To the Greeks, I came as a Greek. To the poor, I came as poor. You always go on the level of whoever you're with. Use that spiritual discernment. Don't act like you're something so high and mighty and special. I mean, that'd be a real good way to get God's wrath to come down on you. But just be, be a humble servant of God and treat others like you would want to be treated. Verse 17. Reco recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. So one, we're about to see you let God take the vengeance. This is, it's interesting that little phrase, provide things honest in the sight of all men. It doesn't really come out in the English, but that word provide means to take thought beforehand. It means to plan ahead even for any situation that might come up. So you know that you don't make a fool of yourself or so you don't start acting like a jerk. Because if you do, other people will say, oh, well, he claims to be a Christian and he acts like that. People, you'll get, give people the opportunity to say, well, I don't want to be a Christian if that's how they act. 
So think beforehand, plan ahead. Any type of situation, think of what might happen and think to yourself that you, you don't want to act in a bad way because we are to shed the light of Jesus Christ. Credibility is so important. Don't ever give anyone an opportunity by what you do to scoff at Christianity. Verse 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Of course, some people are just evil, and it's not possible to live peaceably. So what do you do? You get away from them. Check out 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. If someone wants to go against the ways of God, you depart from them. Verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. That means to God's wrath. For it is written... Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. That's why you can have so much peace and you don't have to go off and take vengeance on yourself. Like we learned in 1 Samuel 25, David, he was ready to go kill them all. But no, Abigail, God used that woman, Abigail, to intercede, to get David to chill out. And you let God take the vengeance. And like we learned there, when you don't take it on yourself, you know you're going to get blessed by God. And then when the blessings come, you don't have to feel guilty because you went off, flew off the handle and did something wrong. So just stay calm, leave the vengeance unto God. This is quoting a verse. It's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35. Deuteronomy 32 is the song of Moses, where it says in Revelation chapter 15, verse 2 and 3, those who stand against and have the victory over the false Christ, they're going to be singing that song of Moses. And of course, it basically all centers around Deuteronomy 32, 31, where it says their rock is not as our rock. You got to know there's two rocks. Satan's coming first, claiming to be Christ, but he's the false Christ. That's at the sixth trumpet. We aren't gathered unto Jesus Christ until the seventh trumpet. So you, gotta, you better know there's two rocks and you better know the false rock arrives first. Verse 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. And one very uh, specific thing that th this even means is that when someone's doing evil against you, but then you just remain calm, you don't freak out about it, you're not mean back to them, that gets them thinking. Ho coals of fire get reaped on their head first because they feel convicted. And that gets them thinking, how is this person staying so calm? How do they have peace through that? And they want that peace. And you can even bring someone to the love of Jesus Christ that way. So don't backbite. Don't mock them back or cuss them out. Just remain calm. Leave it in God's hands. And uh, I, I wanted to say also, this is, this is quoting... Uh, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 21 and 22. And even, it even takes it a step further in that verse. It says it'll heap coals of fire on their head and God will reward you. Verse 21. Such a special verse. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. I mean, th that says it all. When bad things start happening, don't let that evil overcome you and you go on their level. You overcome the evil with good and try to bring them to Jesus Christ. Because, of course, we would hope, just like God hopes, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, God wishes that all would come to repentance and to eternal life. You know, from Revelation 20, that's not going to happen. But we would hope, even our enemies, we would hope that they would come to that peace of mind and salvation that only comes through Jesus Christ. The next spot we're going to go, turn with me to the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 20. We're going to pick it up, Jeremiah chapter 20. Or, and actually, I forgot, I want to read the last verse of Jeremiah chapter 19. So we're going to go Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 15. All throughout, basically, the book of Jeremiah, or many, many parts of it, Jeremiah is prophesying the king of Babylon's coming. Well, I hope you, and of course it was Nebuchadnezzar at this time, but who is the king of Babylon that's coming in the future to us? Isaiah chapter 14, Lucifer, when Satan arrives on earth as the false Christ. So Jeremiah's prophesying the king of Babylon's coming, but people didn't want to hear it. 
Just like people don't want to hear, hear it today that your job is to stand against the false Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. Most people, they just want to believe the lie that they're going to fly away in a rapture. And that is a lie. Our job is to stand against Satan and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. That's Mark 13. So let's pick it up. Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 15. And it reads, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring upon this city and upon all her towns all the evil that I have pronounced against it. That's all the calamity. Because they have hardened their necks that they might not hear my words. They didn't want to hear that the king of Babylon's coming. And guess what? He's coming. And people who don't want to listen to the truth, they want to listen to lies, they want to be gone, God's going to let that calamity come down on them. He's going to let them be deceived. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 could not be any more clear about that. It's the deception of the false Christ that comes first. And it says if you don't want to go the way of righteousness, God will send you strong delusion. God will let you be deceived if you don't want to get into the word. So, do you want to listen to God's word or do you want to listen to men? Let's go to chapter 20, verse 1. Now, Pastor, the son of Emmer, the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, I mean, big shot preacher, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. He heard that, the king of, that Jeremiah said, King of Babylon's coming and he's going to take Jerusalem. And Satan will arrive in the future and he's going to take Jerusalem. But how does he do it? Not by war. You learn in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 11 that by peace Satan will destroy many. Why? Because he claims to be the prince of peace. Claims to be the Messiah. Not by killing people like, like many falsely teach. But he comes perfecting that one world system, bringing a message of salvation and love and peace. That's why almost the whole world's going to be deceived by him. Verse 2. Then Pastor smote Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. Jeremiah was hated for teaching truth. You will be hated by teaching truth. It says in Mark 13, verse 13, the world's going to hate you. But as long as you remain true, you're going to be saved. And we, did, we talked in the last study, you know from Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, when you refuse to worship the false Christ, you're going to be thrown in prison for 10 days. Jeremiah being thrown in the stocks here, that's fine. You know from Luke chapter 21, verse 18, not one hair on your head will perish. And you know from Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 20, that you have power over Satan and, and the fallen angels and all evil spirits through the name of Jesus Christ. And it says, nothing shall by any means hurt you. So stick to God's word. You know you're protected. Yeah, you're going to be hated. That's fine. Who cares? Verse 3, And it came to pass on the morrow that Pasher brought forth Jeremiah out of the stocks. Then said Jeremiah unto him, The Lord hath not called thy name Pasher, but Magor Mishabib. You know what that means? Terror on every side. And that's how it's going to be for people who want to go against someone who teaches God's word. And like it says in the Gospels, it'd be better that a millstone were thrown around your neck and you cast into the sea and drown than you were to go against one of the little ones who served Jesus Christ. And remember Luke chapter 17, verse 1 and 2. It says offenses are going to come. It's inevitable offenses are going to happen. But woe unto those by who through they come. You do not want to go against the servants of God. Verse 4. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and thine eyes shall behold it. And I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive into Babylon, and shall slay them with the sword. Now it was, Nebuchadnezzar killed many people literally at that time, but the king of Babylon who's coming in the future when Satan arrives at the, as the false Christ, it's all about a spiritual death by deception. Not murdering people. You, we know at the end when Satan finally, when people start realizing who he is because they hear the Holy Spirit speak through you, Satan at the end will kill the two witnesses. And we know Antipas will be murdered also. But other than that, it's all, and that's at the very end when the two witnesses are killed. But it's all about deception. Satan's not going to be going around killing people. No one would be deceived by that. 
By peace he will destroy many. Daniel chapter 8 verse 25. It's a spiritual death that he brings by people being deceived and worshiping him. Verse 5, but don't worry, even those who are deceived, they will have the opportunity for salvation in the thousand year teaching period of Revelation chapter 20. But you don't want to have to be spiritually dead for that thousand years. You don't want to have to feel that shame. You want to be those who stand against the false Christ and will reign with Jesus Christ for that thousand years as is written in Revelation chapter 20. Verse 5. Moreover, I will deliver all the strength of this city and all the labors thereof and all the precious things thereof and all the treasures of the kings of Judah will I give into the hands of their enemies, which shall spoil them and take them and carry them to Babylon. Verse 6, And thou, pastor, and all that dwell in thine house shall go into captivity, and thou shalt come to Babylon, and, and there thou shalt die and shalt be buried there, thou and all thy friends to whom thou hast prophesied lies. You do not want to be a false prophet, a preacher telling lies. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17 says, Judgment begins at the house of God. I mean, you better be knowing what you're talking about. You better teach God's word if you claim to be of the cloth. And Ezekiel chapter 13 is all about false prophets. It says, Woe to those who prophesy out of their own heart. And it says, Woe to those that hunt souls to make them fly. You do not want to teach that false doctrine. And I, I want to mention, I mentioned Revelation chapter 20, verse, uh, Revelation chapter 20. I want to mention verse 4 because many people, they, they get it twisted. It talks about it, those who stand against the false Christ, they will reign with Jesus Christ for a thousand years. But it also, it talks about how those who were beheaded for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And that's where many people say, oh yeah, people are going to be getting their heads chopped off during the tribulation. No, that's not what it's talking about, those who are beheaded. It's talking about those who are beheaded all throughout time, like John the Baptist. All the elect of throughout all time, John the Baptist, Paul, everybody, they are reunited with the elect of the end times, and they all are reunited at the return of Christ to reign with that thousand years. Remember, Satan not killing people when he arrives. By peace he will destroy many. Verse 7. O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Right off the bat, you know that's not the right translation. That word deceived here, it should be translated as persuaded. Jeremiah said, Lord, thou hast persuaded me, and I was persuaded. Saying to be a prophet of God. You know from Jeremiah chapter 1, before Jeremiah was even in the womb, when he was still in a spiritual body with God, he was, he was, uh, he was chosen by God. And you know that God's elect were chosen before. And then it even says that while Jeremiah was in the womb, Jeremiah was ordained a prophet. So Jeremiah is saying, God, you persuaded me to teach your word. Continuing, thou art stronger than I and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. Everyone mocked Jeremiah for teaching the truth. You'll get mocked also. It's an honor to suffer for Christ's sake. Don't ever let that wear at you or get you down. But Jeremiah is kind of saying, he's, he's not questioning God, but he's, like, he's kind of like, what's going on here? And remember, all these types to teach us how to handle it when things might seem real bad. And I want you to remember Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3 and 4, where it says, Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. Speaking of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he was crucified. When you think times are real hard, remember what he went through. And it says, ye have not resisted against sin, striving unto blood. You didn't shed your blood on the cross, but Christ did. He came in the flesh to do that for us. So if you ever start feeling sorry for yourself, remember what our Savior Jesus Christ did for us. Verse 8. Still Jeremiah speaking. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil. He's saying everywhere I go, I try to tell the truth that people are coming against me with violence and with spoil. Because the word of God was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. That means that people just were trying to make a laughing stock out of me just because I was teaching the truth. Learn from this. 
verse 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. Jeremiah, there was a point he said, I'm not going to even teach God's word anymore. It's too hard. But then what? But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. If you're God's elect, you, have, you can't help but study the word and share it with others. It might get really, really hard for a second. You might think that you want to stop, but then that burning fire will be within you. You know you love God too much to stop. Even Elijah in 1 Kings 19, he said, God, just kill me now. I mean, Jezebel wanted him dead. He felt like he was the only one left that was serving God. So these things happened even to the, some of the greatest of the prophets. Even, it was, even they were ready to get up for a second. But give up for a second. That fire burned in them. They love God too much and you love God too much to stop. Keep right on going. It's always 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God's always going to give you a way out. Don't you ever give up. All these things happen to teach us exactly how to get it done. Verse 10. For I heard the defaming of many. Fear on every side. That's remember, Megor, Mishabib. It might seem like it's fear on every side to you for a minute, but God's going to turn it right around on your enemies. Defaming, that means slander. People making up lies about him. They'll do that to you also. Then they, so what they, the enemies were saying, report, say they, and we will report it. Let's try to let's just find one thing that Jeremiah says wrong and we'll use it against him. They did the same thing to Christ in Luke chapter 11, verse 54. It says, The scribes and Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse them. They did it to Jesus Christ, our Savior. Why do you think you would be any different? That's why you have to be so careful to protect your credibility and what comes out of your mouth because the wicked will use any chance they get to use it against you. And way more importantly, they use it against Christianity to try to turn people away from it. James chapter 3 lets you know how big a fire just something out of your word, something out of your mouth can cause. Protect your credibility. Continuing in verse 10. All my familiars, that means people you love. Watch for my halting and look for your downfall. Saying, peradventure, that means perhaps he will be enticed. And we shall prevail against him and we shall take our revenge on him. Do not give the enemy any ammunition to use against you or against Christianity. Verse 11. But the Lord is with me as a mighty terrible one. He's terrible to the end of your enemies. Therefore my persecutors shall stumble and they shall not prevail they shall be greatly ashamed, for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. How could you ever worry with a verse like that? Verse 12. But, O Lord of hosts, that triest the righteous. That means he's going to test you out. Yeah, hard times are going to come. God wants to know if you truly love him or if you just only love him when, it, when only life is perfect. God will test you out. I mean, he tested Abraham. He tested, he will test you. Remember, uh, it's like you're going through a fire and the slag runs, like silver going through the fire and the slag runs off. You s stay faithful and you will even become a better servant. You'll know how to better help others. Like it, I think it's Philippians chapter 1 verse 14. It talks about how Paul, when he was going through such hard times, he remained so strong and other people saw that and that made them strong. You set the example. So verse, uh, verse 12, But O Lord of hosts that tries the righteous, he tests you and seeth the reins in the heart. He knows even what your thoughts are. Let me see thy vengeance on them. For unto thee have I opened my cause. That means Jeremiah is saying, I've completely committed myself to you. And of course, God, once again, God knows our thoughts. That Psalms 37, remember that's an acrostic psalm like we talked about in the last study. How verses 7, 20, and 34 stick out. Well, verse 7, like it says, don't, don't um, be jealous of the wicked. They're going to get what they deserve. Verse 20 says that the wicked are going to be like the, the, like the fat of a lamb. They're going to go and smoke for, up and smoke forever and ever. They're blotted out if they follow Satan at the end of the millennium. Their soul perishes. 
And then verse 34, the third verse that sticks out, it says, You be patient and wait on the Lord, and the wicked are cut off, you will see it. Verse 13, Sing unto the Lord, praise ye the Lord. Don't ever forget to thank God for what He does for you. Make, make His wonderful works known to others. For He hath delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of evildoers. That means He delivers the helpless. Don't ever forget to praise Him. Turn with me a few books back. Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 16. In the last study we did, uh, we were in 1 Samuel chapter 25 learning about David. Let's learn some more about David. Now, what we have going on here in 2 Samuel 16, David's son Absalom, one of the greatest types for the false Christ, he just usurped David's throne. Convinced many people to follow Absalom instead of following David, who David was the true king. Of course, the true David, our Lord, David being a type of our true Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Absalom usurped the throne. And David, he's getting out of Jerusalem because he doesn't want civil war. So David's getting out of Jerusalem. We're going to pick it up in 2 Samuel chapter 16, and verse 5. And don't ever make the mistake of thinking that David is a coward. He, he fled Jerusalem because he felt like that's what God wanted him to do. David was a warrior. He slew Goliath when he was just about a teenager. And don't make no mistake, David was a warrior. But sometimes the wise thing is just to get out of there. That is the wise thing to do sometimes. So we're picking it up, 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 5, and it reads, And when King David came to Baharim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, that be the house of Benjamin, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came. He's cursing David, the rightful king. Verse 6, And he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David, and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. Verse 7, And thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, that means go out, get out of here. Come out or go out, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial. Remember in our last study, 1 Samuel 25, there was an actual man of Belial, that means a wicked, worthless man named Nabal. And now, what, what did we just read in Jeremiah? They're going to slander you. That's what Shimei is doing to David, slandering him, saying that he's a wicked, worthless man. And what do you think people are going to say to you when you refuse to worship who, ever, who the world thinks is the true Messiah? And you refuse to worship him? I mean, when you're getting delivered to stand against the false Christ, even when it's time for the allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through you, no doubt there's going to be people on every side cursing you, mocking you, hating you. Are you going to wither? You better not. Stay strong. Once again, all these things to teach us, to prepare us for that time. Verse 8. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. The Shimei, he's trying to say that David murdered Benjamites. That's a lie. He never murdered one Benjamite. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Claiming that David murdered a bunch of Benjamites, which is a lie. But we do have to know David did commit murder in 2 Samuel chapter 11, 12 when he sent Uriah out on the front lines and got him killed. That did happen. But, this is, but he did not kill a bunch of Benjamites. These are slanders that Shimei is speaking. But then what happened in 2 Samuel 12? God forgave David because he sincerely repented. Verse, uh, verse 9. Yeah, verse 9. Then Abishai, the son of Zariah, th then said Abishai, the son of Zariah, first of all, I want to tell you about Abishai and how much of an incredible warrior he was. It says in, um, in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 18, he killed, he slew 300 men by himself. That was in battle. That was no sin. But he was, he was such a warrior. He was able to take 300 all at one time. And he was so loyal to David. When Saul kept trying to murder David, uh, Abishai said, let me just kill him for you. But David said, no, Saul was God's anointed and he was God's anointed king. 
So he said, no, we're not going to do that. Don't do that. So he didn't. And then also um, in 2 Samuel chapter 21, Abishai even slew a giant. So a, a, a very loyal, incredible warrior was this Abishai. So verse 9, Then said Abishai, the son of Zariah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Talking about Shimei. Why, why, why are we putting up with this? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. Let me go cut this guy's head off right now, this Shimei who's cursing the true king. Verse 10, And the king, that's David, said, what have I to do with you, ye sons of Zariah? Talking about Abishai and probably Abishai's brother Joab. He probably chimed in as well. So what David's saying is, I don't have the mindset right now that you have of wanting to chop off his head. So let him curse, because the Lord hath said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? And he, he's just putting his complete faith in God. And remember, sometimes things will happen that it's all a part of God's plan to, 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 for you to set the example to others. A way you can even, that you will even learn from, that you can help others. I have to make it very clear, like I already said once, Jeremiah 23, do not go blaming your problems on God. That's a, one of the biggest mistakes that you can make. But sometimes things do happen that God is using it to, to make you strong and also to help others. Verse 11, And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold my son, which came forth... He, okay, I kinda, I'm kind of i going to restart this because I kind of said it in the wrong way. Verse 11, And David also said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold my son, which came forth of my bowels. He's talking about Absalom, the one who just usurped the throne. Seeketh my life. He's saying my own son is trying to take my throne. And not only that, but he's trying to kill me. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone and let him curse. For the Lord hath bidden him. Just, just let it go. You remember that. Let it go. If someone's talking against you. Remember Luke chapter 6 verse 22 and 23. says when you are mocked and when people separate themselves from you. And you're slandered for Christ's sake. It says, rejoice and leap for joy in that day, for great is your reward in heaven. Don't take vengeance on yourself. Like we've been studying, you leave the vengeance to Almighty God. Verse 12, don't ever forget this verse. It may be that the Lord will look on my affliction, and that the Lord will requite me good for His cursing this day. If you just leave it in God's hands... God's going to bring blessings down on you and you don't have to feel any kind of guilt because you just let it go. You left, in, you left it in God's hands. That's so much wisdom. Now the time is going to come. That what's ultimately, making a long story short, what's ultimately going to happen, David's going to remind David's son Solomon on David's deathbed, you remember what that guy Shimei did. Solomon makes an agreement with Shimei. He says, look, you stay out of here. You go over there. And as long as you stay over there, I'll let you live. Well, Shimei broke the contract. He left. Solomon had him killed. God's justice brought forth. Verse 13. And as David and his men went by the way, Shimei went along on the hillside over against him and cursed as he went. And threw stones at him and cast dust. I mean, the, the devil doesn't give up easily. They're going to keep coming at you. But remember, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's, I think that's James chapter 4, verse 7. So yeah, he'll keep coming for a second. But remain calm. God is on the throne. Remember, he's got your back. Now, we're not going to go any further here. But I, I do want to mention what, what, what happens right after this. David, he sends his guy, Hushai, he sends him into Absalom's camp, kind of like a double agent. Hushai is acting like he's on Absalom's side, but he's just a spy. He's actually on David's side. God will give you wisdom to overcome the enemy. And what ends up happening, Ahithophel, who uh, betrayed David, he gives Absalom some incredible advice that would have probably got David killed. But then Hushai, the one who's working for David, Absalom says, well, let's hear what Hushai has to say. Hushai gives him some different advice. And Absalom says, oh, okay, let's go with Hushai's advice. Guess what? That ends up being Absalom's downfall. 
So you trust God. He, God will use covert activity. He always gives you the wisdom to overcome the enemy. Remember one time, David, when he came to Gath, David started acting crazy because he knew they were about to kill him. Who knows what type of tactics we're going to have to use in that final five months, the tribulation of the false Christ. But you know we're going to have the two witnesses prophesying. You're going to, God through the, and God through the Holy Spirit will give you every piece of wisdom that you need to overcome the enemy. Just always remember, do not do it your own way. You do it God's way. Now let's turn back to the New Testament. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. I've noticed that we've gone to this Hebrews chapter 10 in quite a few different special studies because these verses are, are just so amazing. We're going to pick it up in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30, and it reads, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. See, judgment for those who serve God is rewards, but it's wrath for those who go against Him and His ways. Verse 31, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You do not want to be on the wrong side, as is made so clear so many different times. Verse 32, But call to remembrance the former days, in which after you were illuminated, after you came to the truth, like after you realize that the, that the idea that Eve ate an apple was just a fairy tale, after you figured out what actually happened in the garden in Genesis 3, after, after you just read it in the Bible, you realize the apple is not there. After you learned about the first earth age, after you learned that it's the false Christ that arrives first, after you learned there is no rapture and that's a lie created by Satan and taught by men, after you were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Satan brought everything he could at you once you learned the truth. Why? Because he wants you to wither. He wants you to think like Jeremiah thought for a second. It's not worth it. It's too much. I'm done with it. So yeah, Satan's going to bring it hard at you. When you first come to the truth, you better not wither. Stay strong. Like Matthew chapter 13, that chapter teaches you exactly what happened in the garden. But also in the parable of the sower, it talks about many people, when they first hear the truth, they, this is Matthew chapter 13, about verse 20. It says, when they first hear the truth, they get so excited. But then tribulation comes, then persecution comes, and they wither, they fall away. It's too much for them. Don't ever let that happen. Verse 33. Partly while you were made a gazing stock, that means they tried to expose you as a spectacle, tried to make a laughing stock out of you, both by reproaches, as by mockings and slandering and afflictions, and partly while she became companions of them that were so used. If it wasn't, if it wasn't you going through it yourself, you went to help others who were going through it. You kept that sympathy. Verse 34. For you had compassion of me and my bonds. Remember, this is Paul speaking. He was thrown in prison just for teaching the truth, just like Jeremiah was. For you had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. So once again, if somebody rips you off, take it joyfully. You got rewards coming in heaven so great you can't even imagine. And like we talked about last time, Job, Job lost everything. Even in the flesh, God gave Job double what he even lost. So don't stress. Take it joyfully. You know you got so many rewards coming. To waste one second on worrying, it's just not worth it. Verse 35. Cast not away therefore your confidence which hath great recompense of reward. You keep that confidence, man, are you going to be rewarded. Verse 36, For you have need of patience. You stay firm, you stay immovable. You have need of patience, that after you, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Don't overlook that. you got to do it God's way first. Verse 37, For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Jesus Christ is going to return. 
We are only in these flesh bodies such a very short time. I mean, we were in a spiritual body with God in the first earth age and then also leading up to the time He put your soul in a flesh body. Who knows how long the first earth age lasted? Probably millions of years is how long our souls have been alive. And we're only in these flesh bodies about a maximum of 100 I mean, a hundred years, that is like less than nothing. So yeah, there might be some real hard times in the flesh. It's such a short time. Stay strong. Christ is returning. But don't ever forget, it's the false Christ who arrives first. Verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. The very next chapter after this, Hebrews chapter 11 all about people who had great faith and teaching you to have great faith. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And it says, faith is the evidence of things not seen. You don't need, we know God is real by how he, how his word, we see his word come to pass exactly as it's written, how he makes good on his promises, how he touches your heart with the Holy Spirit. It's not like you're 99.99% sure, you know, for a 1 million percent fact, God is real. Because you feel His love. But without that faith, it's impossible to please God. Don't be like doubting Thomas. He said, oh, I got, I got to see the marks in His hands. But no, like Christ would say, blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. And that's you. And remember, true belief is you know for a one million percent fact there is no doubt. Once you study God's Word and you see how true it is. And you feel that love in your heart. So the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Don't you draw back. That word means to cower. Don't cower when the world starts hating you for sharing the truth. Don't cower when the entire world basically hates you when you refuse to worship the false Christ. You stand against the false one. Don't you cower. Don't you draw back. Verse 39, we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. You'll see in your Strong's Concordance, if you look it up, that word draw back is a little different. It'll tell you in your Strong's that that even means to apostatize into perdition. Who is the son of perdition? Satan, because he's the only one by name since to death. Ecclesiastes or Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 18 and 19. So do not you draw back and cower and apostatize and be deceived and worship the false Christ. Don't you do it. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul, you stay strong, you believe to the saving of the soul. We are not going to draw back. Now to complete this study, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. After Hebrews, you have James, and then you have Peter right after that. This will be the last place we go for this study, to complete this second part of this study. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, and it reads, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. In that very uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11 we were just talking about, it talks about how Abraham, he knew that he's just a foreigner in these flesh bodies. Because our true home is in a spiritual body with our Heavenly Father. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 makes it so clear. You have a flesh body and you have a spiritual body. And Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7, when your flesh body dies, your spirit returns to God who gave it. But abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. We're only here a short time. Don't let that bring you down. Verse 12. Having your conversation or your behavior honest among the Gentiles. And just for today, uh, have your conversation honest against anybody, uh, everybody, period. But also against those who are not Christian. Why? You set the example. Hopefully bring them to Christ. That whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they act like you're evil, talk like you're evil, that, that, that they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. They see how you remain calm. They see how you give glory to God and how you have wisdom and peace. Hopefully that will bring them into the love of Jesus Christ. At the very least, hopefully they get saved in the millennium. Verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme. Obey man's law. 
You obey God's law and you obey man's law. The only time that you go against the laws of the land is if they're trying to take away your religious freedom. That's the only time. It seems like people today think it's a righteous thing to rebel against the government. It's not. Romans 13, here and many other places, you obey the law. You don't mock the king or you don't mock the president. You don't talk bad against, you don't talk bad against him. Why? Because God's the one that put him there. God sets up kings. He puts down kings. Daniel 2, 21, verse 14. Or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God. It's the will of God. Everyone gets what they deserve, good or bad. That with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Don't give them one bit of ammunition they can accuse you with. Protect your credibility. 16. As free, and not and Christ did set us free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Some people say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm set free. I can just go sin, do whatever I want. It doesn't matter. I, then I'm saved no matter what. That's Satan's doctrine. Like, he, what, did he, what did he say in, in Matthew chapter 4? He said to Christ, oh, did just jump off this building. The angels, the angels save you. Jump off this mountain. Satan twists, script, Satan twists scripture. Satan would love for you to think that you could just go commit any sin you want and never repent and you're going to be saved. Well, that's a lie. You have to repent of your sins, and true repentance is to think different afterwards. To set it in your mind, you're not going to commit that same sin. Do not use how Christ set us free to just, don't act like that means you can just do whatever you want, do all kinds of wickedness, and you're still going to live forever. And that would, you don't ever be deceived by that lie. Someone even told me one time, oh yeah, if, if you just believe Christ is the Savior, you can go murder and rape people and never repent and you're still saved. You would believe someone that would say that? That's what comes out of some pulpits. I mean, what a joke. Once again, that's what Satan would love to have you believe. Repent or you will perish. Luke chapter 13, verse 3, verse 17. Honor all men. That means value all men. Love the brotherhood, the, our fellow Christian brothers and sisters. Fear God, that means you revere Him. The only reason you would have to fear God is if you're doing what's wrong. Honor the king. Once again, you don't talk bad about the president. God sets him up. What, whatever nation you're from, your king, whatever. You, and sometimes they might be doing wicked things. We talked about how God anointed Saul as the king. You know how way off it he went. Pure wickedness. But, the, but just like we just talked about, I'm so glad we mentioned it before. David, even though how wicked Saul was, David told Abishai, do not kill Saul. It's God's anointed. We're not going against the one God set up as king. And we don't go against the president. You don't go against the leader. The only way that you don't follow the laws of the land is if they're trying to take away the way you serve God. But otherwise, just follow the law. And that gives us the freedom that we can even teach the word of God exactly as it's written. And no one can tell us what we can or cannot teach. There are very, very few places in the world that have true religious freedom. This United States of America is really pretty much the only one. And praise God for it. I mean, I can't believe how people act like they think the United States is a bad country. They have no idea what happens in other countries. We are so blessed to live in the nation that is one nation under God. Verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. Verse 19. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, means you didn't do anything wrong, but you're still suffering. Verse 20. For, for what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? Meaning if, you, if you're receiving God's correction, Hebrews chapter 12, God, God corrects those he loves. If you're receiving God's correction and you're taking it patiently, that, that's not any type of big deal because that's what you're supposed to do. But, continuing verse 20, But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, that is acceptable with God. That'll get God's attention. 
people are coming against you, you know you did nothing wrong, but you still take it patiently, that's acceptable to God. And remember 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, how, how it says, um, it, it says, my, my mind just went blank. Oh, it says, endure hardness as a, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, and you remain faithful and patient. Verse 21, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ, ha because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Romans 8, 17 and 18, we talk about it often. If you suffer with Christ, you will reign with him. And the hard times we go through now are not even to compare to the glory that will be revealed in you. And it even says another place, if you suffer and if you persevere, then you will reign with Christ. But you have to persevere. You can't wither and cower. Be strong. Verse 22. Who did no sin, speaking of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. He was never deceitful. He never sinned. And look how much he suffered. He died on the cross for us. Listen to the example that he set. Verse 23. Who, when he was reviled, when he was mocked, when he was slandered, reviled not again. He didn't do it back. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. He committed himself to the Father Almighty God. So when you're mocked and hated today, and especially when the time comes you're really going to be hated, when you refuse to worship the false Christ, don't mock back. Just remember, you are not even to premeditate what you will say when it's time for you to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. You just remain silent. Remember when Christ was accused, He opened not His mouth and Pilate marveled. That was to teach us. You remain silent. Don't premeditate. Then when you, when you are delivered to the magistrates, it will be the Holy Spirit that speaks through you. Every language all at one time. That's why no one can gainsay nor resist it. As it's written in Luke 21. Verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That word tree, the word just means wood. Of course, he was crucified on a cross, as is written so many times. And you know from history that Romans crucified people on a cross. So he's crucified on the wood, on the cross, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. That's quoting Isaiah chapter 53, which gives incredible details about the crucifixion. And of course, that's Old Testament. Just like Psalms chapter 22 gives detailed uh, details of the crucifixion many, many years before it happened. By his stripes we are healed. Jesus Christ set us free. Verse 25 to complete. For ye, as, for ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. When you repent, don't ever forget Psalm chapter 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. God protects us from our enemies. And it also even says there, thou preparest a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. I mean, people that mocked you, people that hated you, God's going to prepare a table before you in their presence. They're going to realize how bad they messed up talking bad about you, coming against you. Everything will be set right when the true Christ returns. That's when we are all changed into spiritual bodies, as is written in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. So you know if you're still in the flesh, Christ hasn't returned. Don't forget it's the false Christ that arrives first. Everything will be set right. You will be rewarded. And you will even reign with Christ through that thousand year teaching period of Revelation 20. Don't ever forget the title of these messages, these first and second part. Be at peace. God has your back and He truly does. You leave it in His hands. Nothing to fear. Nothing to worry. The perfect peace that Jesus Christ gives us the world does not give. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father. We thank you so much for the, your word and the peace and happiness you give us. And we thank you for this place you've given us. We can share your word. And we just ask you to continue to give us understanding, not just for ourselves, but so we can share it with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen.
This was recorded in the year 2022 at Smyrna Christian Church, Kokomo, Indiana by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.